Doctor Who magazine for the 60th anniversary of the show, Red Dwarf, no, the Doctor Who, have been doing massive audience polls to find out the best stories from each respective Doctors. We've got the results from their latest issue, and there's some interesting stuff here. For literally <laughs> 25 years running, Remembrance of the Daleks has topped the poll for the Seventh Doctor. For 25 years running, The Curse of Fenric has also been the second. Survival, which has maintained the third place spot for Ted. Basically, fans are pretty much set in their ways when it comes to the Seventh Doctor. Time of the Rani, Delta and the Bannerman, Paradise Towers, Sylvan Nemesis, Dragonfire, The Happiness Patrol. Battlefield feels way higher than it should be, but okay. The Greatest Show in the Galaxy. Ghostlight, Survival, Curse of Fenric, and Remembrance of the Daleks. Uh, they've done some great write-ups on what like the top three stories, uh, but the, these are audience selections. This one's quite interesting as well. Once again, for 18 years in a row, Empty Child and the Doctor Dances is number one, Bad Wolf Parting of the Ways, and Dalek are two and three. And far, We are very set in our ways. We are very predictable Doctor Who fans. Long Game is number 10. Um, but part of that is because there just aren't as many stories from these Perspective doctors you've got 12 here and then you've got 10 here as well so there's not quite as much room for uh for divergent or very different rankings especially when these stories have been watched by so much of the fan base and the consensus has already basically formed around them so what they're doing right now is that the next issue is going to have the 10th and 11th doctors um there's no there's no poll here for the 8th doctor i'm assuming that the love and the outpouring of support for the tv movie was simply too great but if you go on DoctorWhoMagazine.com and you go on the DWM poll section, you can vote. So 11 and 12, that's already been decided. Uh, for 10 and 11, that's already been decided. The votes have been cast and that's going to be the subject of the next issue of Doctor Who Magazine. But the 12th Doctor and the 13th Doctor, those polls are still open. When do they close? When do the polls close? This poll closes on the 19th of July... But folks, me and you, you specifically, Ben, we're going to be going through this poll together, okay? You can obviously do it yourself, but I'm going to rank out of 10 all of the 12th and 13th Doctor stories. We're going to do it the same way that they pick the Pope. We're going to rate them out of 10, and then Doctor Who magazine is going to accumulate all of the tallies and all of the rankings and put it in a preferential ballot. So, let's go. Deep Breath, Six of Us. I'm inclined... Uh, some of these stories I've not watched for a long time. Presumably, that's why my opinion is going to be superior to so many others. So, Deep Breath, I'm feeling six. Is that controversial? Six or seven. Into the Dalek, I'm very confident putting four. I did a whole review for Dalek Sem before it. Why I don't really think it particularly works. Eight, seven, no, you are you folks are way too charitable. Robot of Sherwood, I've not seen for quite a while. I remember thinking it was okay. We're going to go for five. We're going to go for right down the middle. Listen, I am also feeling in a similar category. We're also going to be pretty quick as well. So you folks are going to have to be quick on the mark with your uh, with your ratings and also maybe be ready for the next one as well. Listen, I'm going for four because I think it relies way too much in abstraction and it's not nearly as clever as Stephen Moffat thinks it is. So I'm, I'm okay, I'm seeing some eights. I did dismiss your higher rankings for Into the Dalek and Robot of Sherwood, but maybe I'll go for five. Who knows? Time Heist, I like Time Heist. And also it's got the um, Jenna Coleman in the blazer with the tie and the shirt. So it's got the best Clara look of the whole series. So I think that instantly gives it an 8. Caretaker, 5. Whatever. We're going to be really, really average with it. Kill the Moon. The thing is, is that really, really smart people I know love Kill the Moon. But I don't like Kill the Moon. So I'm not sure if it's something that I'm missing. There, are, Defrost River said, I, I challenge you to name me better Clara looks than Time Heist. I challenge you. Time Heist Clara. You, Defrost of Robot 77, you think that there's a better Clara look than this? Do, really? Are we going to have this conversation now? 
midstream. Na name the episode to Frosted Robot 77. Do it. Name it. Face the Raven. No, that's just a cardigan. Send Mummy on the Orient Express, Clara. This week will stands for Jenna, for Jenna Coleman in Time Heist exclusively. Um, okay, this is a good look, but this is like, you know, once in a blue moon you dress up like this. The hair's nice though. Eye makeup is strong, but come on. That's a good look, though. Defrost Robot 77, you have earned the com you, you, you have earned a, a slight retraction. I might, I was maybe a bit too harsh to you. We're not having a Jenna off because she's not here to participate. So, kill the moon, five, go. Mummy on the Orient Express, eight. And eight, is like, I, I, eight means I really like it. Kill the moon, ten. Mm. You did say, Jack, that you liked the live stream, so I think we'll do that. <laughs> Okay, flatline, nine. Flat, like, t 10 out of 10 is, like, reserved for your, um, Bad Wolf Parting of the Ways, your Heaven Sense, your Midnights and stuff. But flatline is, like, unambiguously the strongest of the, fir of Capaldi's first series. In the Forest of the Night, I've not watched it since broadcast. Mummy is so much better than flatline. When you're competing with an 8 out of 10 or a 9 out of 10... I appreciate the opinion, and if you appreciate Mummy more than Flatline or vice versa, that's also valid. But I'm not gonna like I'm not gonna lose sleep over a one point difference when I love them both. Um, in the Forest of the Night, maybe a two, two or three. I've not watched it for a while. I just remember it not being very good, and I've listened to Review of Death's recent episode of it as well. Let's go for a three. Dark Water, Death in Heaven, though is not very good and i do have quite recent memories of it it takes a special type of bad that you make an episode so questionable a story and plot line so poorly judged that the bbc have to actively misrepresent your story when they get when it gets numerous complaints i'm going for one last christmas is also not very good let's go for a four review of death are wrong T take it up with them uh, so yeah, not the best showing. It's not a great season. Mm. Uh, Mission Magician's Apprentice and The Witch is Familiar. Also not very good. It's probably the worst Dalek story in my opinion. It goes Magician's Apprentice, Witch is Familiar, or Asylum of the Daleks, and then Destiny. I'm gonna, yeah, let's go for a two. Listeners, great. A lot of these stories, because I did not like them on broadcast, I've not properly revisited them. Like, I've not watched Listen or Robot of Sherwood for years. I've not watched In the Forest of the Night since broadcast. I've watched um, Deep Breath since. I've watched Dark Water Death in Heaven for Cyber Semba. Those memories are still quite vivid. I watched Last Christmas, the Christmas before last, I think. It didn't really leap out at me. So yeah, Under the Lake and Before the Flood, nine. This is like the the best story of the series. There is heaven sent down here, but it's so tied to hell bent, and you they they've they've separated these three, which I think is a little bit unfair. But under the lake and before the flood is so good, like it it's it actually cleverly uses the two part format, and for some reason they've separated the girl who died and the woman who lived. Like they're five and five. There we go. <laughs> Zygon Invasion, Zygon Inversion is a seven. It's interesting, a little bit misjudged, but the ending kind of salvages it. Really good performances. I like the Zygon stuff. A couple of cool scenes. Sleep No More, I think, is a bit underrated, but it's still not great. Hmm. I may be leaning towards a four or a five, but it tried something different. Even Doctor Ian Magazine knows there's a major gap between Heaven Sent and Hellbent. Yeah, <laughs> this has been rigged. <laughs> Stop the count. Stop the count. Uh, Flux. What, what, Hazard Tello says Flux is just one score. What? That's not fair. Hmm. We'll cross that when we come to it. Okay. Stay on target. Face the Raven. 
I don't remember much about Face the Raven other than the Trap Street's a cool idea. Clara dies at the end of it, so it's de facto good. But I don't remember much else about it. Very little. Like, I, I actually remember watching it with my housemates at the time. And I remember watching it with them, but I don't remember much about the episode itself. I, I, I might just have to go for six, but I don't know. It's got impactful moments and a really cool premise. But I just, hardly anything sticks out about it other than that ending. Heaven Send 10, Heaven Send 8. No, Heaven Send to 10. I, I did the Perfect Shots video. It's so brilliant. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's beautiful. And then, just to salvage the concept of Doctor Who Magazine doing this, I'll put in Hellbent as one. You have to do pretty, pretty bad in order to undercut your best episode. Like... Hellbent, like, basically makes Heaven Sent inconsequential, which is a crime against Doctor Who, and the police have been informed. Husbands of River Song is better than I remember. It is a Doctor Who Christmas special, so it is, like, so it's pulling almost all of its punches, but Capaldi and Alex Kingston are great. It's directed really, really well by Douglas McKinnon. Matt Lucas is a bit of a drag, but he does so much better in series 10. But the the last 10, 15 minutes are, are lovely. Husbands. Oh, yeah. Return of Doctor Mysterio is here as well. This is also underrated. Six or a seven. Can I put 6.5? Ah, please increment by one. Ah, it got me. Return. I have a feeling that Return of Doctor Mysterio is going to be ranked quite low by some fans, so I'm going to give it the set. I'm going to round up to seven, because I, people who are giving their answers to Return of Doctor Mysterio in chat, how long ago did you last watch Return of Doctor Mysterio? Like, I, like, I, I, I'm, cu I'm just curious. When was the last time chat watched Return of Doctor Mysterio? I, w I want to hear times i want to hear months or years or minutes someone in this chat watched it before this stream went live four years about a month i would have talked about by the author it was like how long since you watched hellbent it's seared in my mind evil it's here okay it's i've been heat branded like a cow by a farmer in my brain <laughs> a metaphor but yeah i watched return of dr mysterio at the same time I watched Last Christmas, it was a quite substantial jump up in quality. Um, I think that the superhero homages and the like really played out and tired. This was what, 2016? So this was like four years after the Avengers, eight years after the Dark Knight. This was, no, yeah, yeah, eight years after the Dark Knight. So this was really, really played out at this time. But apart from that, I, I, I dig it. it it's, it's good fun. That is, of course, like most Christmas specials, quite compromised. But yeah, but having a Superman on Earth makes it so universe-breaking. Is the ghost still around at the end of Return of Doctor Mysterio? Demi recently rematched Hellbent and, re re uh, and did like it. If Demi can like it now, why? Because... Mm, I, do, yeah, I do like Demi. She's nice. Hmm... If Dimmy can find room in her heart for Hellbent, maybe you can't. <laughs> uh, okay, now, I'm going to go for the sevens here. But for Husband to River Song, it's a high seven. And for Return of Doctor Mysterio, it's a low seven that I'm rounding up for the sake of the poll. The pilot, also a seven. It's fun, decent start, nothing groundbreaking, but a really good companion introduction. I like it. Um... Pilot is five, pilot eight, pilot... Uh, yeah, let's compromise and go for seven. Smile is also a story I've not watched for quite a while. I remember the twist. I just don't remember much else about it. Smile, seven, smile. Hmm. Lady who I was slightly gave her. I think we all were a little bit. Sympathetically. I'm seeing a lot of... Six. I'm seeing anywhere from five to eight. So we're on the consensus that it's decent. Let's go for six. Thin Ice, the Doctor Punches a Racist. Instant eight out of ten. Knock Knock, I really enjoyed liking as well. Like, it's a seven, but it's a high seven. 
like it depicts landlords as literally parasites oxygen is like another eight like you get these stories which are really really solid they don't change your life they don't do anything too drastic but they're really good and the doctor goes blind now the monk trilogy is really easy to rank because it gets worse as it goes along and it starts at a six easy six five four empress of mars it's like smile i've not i don't think i've watched empress of mars since i did my series ranking in 20 2020 2021 i don't remember anything about it eaters of light i also don't remember much about it world enough for time of the doctor falls is a 10 nope and twice upon a time <laughs> it's really bad it's i have watched that recently and it is really bad and it's become like the more i watch of the hartnell era for my hartnell review marathon the worse twice upon a time gets because the doctor who we meet in twice upon a time is david bradley playing the first doctor after the events of the 10th planet or like before he's about to regenerate so he's grown he's changed he's mellowed out because of his companions and the adventures that he's had but the Doctor that we see in Twice Upon a Time, the way he's written, is an entirely different character. He's he's unrecognisable in terms of his characterization, And David Bradley's doing his best with the material, but it's just not the first Doctor. It's like a parody of the first Doctor done by the Lenny Henry show in the 80s or something. Which is really disappointing. And it goes against so much of what the Doctor Falls is trying to do and trying to accomplish as well. It's like Heaven Sent and like Hell Bent. Like, they're meant to be a two-parter. And, like, this is meant to, like, follow on from The Doctor Falls. But it just contradicts, like, the whole ethos and everything that the prior story is going for. It's really disappointing. Uh, and also... Oh, it's not an evil plan. Th okay, 13th Doctor. 13th Doctor. Woman Who Fell to Earth is a fine, decent start. I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, the Ghost Monument is a story where the script isn't the best. Its characterization isn't particularly dynamic or unique or anything, but it's absolutely salvaged by the direction. It is at, like Mark Tondere is firing on all cylinders, and that carries it. It's the production is such a feat. It's such a vibe and mood. I really, really enjoy the Ghost Monument. I'm going to go for an eight. Rosa, uh, I, I always want to bump up the Ghost Monument again, but I know that the chat is is not a big fan of me um rosa um seven or an eight i just wrote <laughs> yes flipping we're all entitled to our wrong opinions um yeah rosa i think we're going to go for a seven here arachnids in the uk a three or a four yeah it really is like the first uh the first big bungle of the series and the the jack robertson character is just it, it is doing nothing for that story Saranga Conundrum, I like it. I had fun with it. I think I'm going to go for a seven. Demons of the Punjab is not even... I'm not even saying it's good for the Chibnall era. It's just genuinely terrific Doctor Who. Demons of the Punjab is one of the best historical stories of the modern era. I, only maybe like behind Vincent and the Doctor. It's it's in the conversation of some of the best historicals that Doctor Who has ever done. Demon, yeah, it's, it's brilliant stuff. Kablam is really good up until the last 10 minutes and i'm really interested until the to see what the target novelization does i love that little robot who is like oh the future is scary and confusing can i can i give you an upsell can i give you an offer i i really wish that, that little robot had been played by matt berry the witch finders uh once again is really good up until the last 10 minutes when the morox turns up and starts acting weird and then it just becomes a monster of the week thing i need to read the target novelization by joy wilkinson that'd be really interesting it takes you away is a nine really good bonkers off the war doctor who which is, i think when doctor who does some of its best work the climax of the story ends in like a white void where the doctor is talking to a talking frog voiced by sharon d clark so it's pretty audacious ribbons is one of the best guest characters of the era so much fun you know <laughs> he's just walking around the cave with this big balloon <laughs> really good and it has a lot to say about grief and stuff i think that uh, bradley walsh it's one of his best outings it's a really lovely story battle of ranskor of coloss i don't dislike it to the extent that everyone else does but i still think it's pretty average bordering on a little bit lower um 
it's got really cool direction and some great ideas. Like the duo species is really cool. And I like the production vibes. I think Jodie Whittaker is really good in it. Tim Shaw's um, actually a pretty decent returning villain for that. But uh, yeah, maybe I need to revisit it because I've not watched it uh, for quite a while. I didn't hate it and I don't think I have it in my heart to hate it. Maybe apart from the ending. Where it's like, we're not going to kill you. We're just going to put you in suspended animation where you're going to be conscious the entire time. To quote Davros in Resurrection of the Daleks, we're going to call it being humane. <laughs> so yeah. Four or five. I, I, even if like you, the chat could talk me into bringing the, the number lower. I don't have it in my heart to hate the Battle of Ranskorav Coloss. Like when it comes to finales, like I said, when it comes to worst finales, you've got to do something pretty special to have. Like for Dark Water and Death, Death in Heaven, the BBC has to actively misrepresent the contents of the finale in order to publicly in order to publicly defend it. Battle of Ranskarav Coloss, for all of its faults, didn't do that. Resolution eight, really good. Probably the best festive special, other than the Christmas Invasion. I, you know, it's not particularly complicated. But it moves at a great pace. The Dalek writing is top notch. The Dalek outside of the casing and puppeteering that human is really good. Really well shot by Wayne Yip. Cool set pieces. The the Dalek in the field with the army is like top tier Doctor Who. Jodie Whittaker's great in it as well. Right, Spyfall. Part one is a solid start. Part two really, really fumbles though. Spyfall surprisingly holds up as a decent part one where it's setting up all these pins, it's setting up the threat and world building and stuff like that. And then Spyfall part two really just does drop the ball. Daniel Barton just walks away at the end with no consequences and no resolution. Um, and I'm surprised that he he's, was never mentioned or brought up again. It's quite astonishing. Um, there's some interesting commentary to maybe be made of having Sasha Dewan as the master dress up and ally himself with the Nazis in Paris in, in, in World War II but it just decides to ignore all that and do the now they'll see the real you it has um Ada Lovelace and uh what's her name Norin Ayat Khan for, and like great characters and worthy historical figures that could have entire stories dedicated to them and decides that they're just going to be background dressing so four or five i'm maybe leaning towards a five because if we were judging spy for part one and two as like a full entity it starts strong and then part two was like how do you save the what well, how are we going to save the world without the doctor oh i guess we're just going to sit in a construction site and do the soft shoe shuffle. It's no, it's no good. Orphan 55 is not good. But it's not the worst thing ever. It's it's just not very well thought out or conceived. The, the, there's some really fun... This is hard. Yeah, I know. It sounds like a parody. But they actually do it straight faced. In Spyfall and in Revolution of the Daleks. Orphan 55... There's some fun bonkers ideas like Ryan having to like suck his thumb to, 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 to recover from that worm in the crisp packet. I like that. I like the... I know the makeup's not great for the cat person, but I, I kind of like it. There's, you know, and the, the dregs are actually pretty cool costumes, but the way they're filmed, they hardly ever interact with the main cast. There's definitely a disconnect. I really want to know what the production issues were behind Orphan 55, because I'm sure there were some. It reeks of it. I'm really proud of my um, series, like, 12 ranking video, my breakdown of Orphan 55. Not the worst thing ever, but yeah, I can't, I don't have enough, like, hate in my heart for it. Nicholas Tesla's Night of Terror, 8. Solid um solid stuff um uh, angeli mahindra is terrific as the skithra queen some really cool ideas nicola tesla's really well applied to it i like it a lot fugitive of the jadoon starts strong and then it kind of just goes off the rails when it turns out that the fugitive is a new incarnation of the doctor who is performed spectacularly well but has zero character and then at the ending they're like okay how are we going to figure this out? And the fugitive's like, no, I just want you to get off my ship now. Um, why? No. Um, I like the fugitive stuff. I like the Jadoon stuff. But then halfway through the story, it just, it, it just kind of devolves for me. 
Praxius is in a similar realm to me as the Sar the Saranga conundrum. Where I talk about people say it's the worst thing ever, and I, I don't see it. I kind of like Praxius. It does feel like the logical extension of like Terry Dicks, um, Terence Dicks, and Barry Letts's ethos during the Third Doctor era of these environmental, socially conscious, earthbound stories. It feels like a natural extension of that. Especially when you've got like the microplastics, which is, you know, they, oh, they beat you over the head with the messages. Oh, you've shoved down your throat. It's the microplastic stuff is just like an organic part of the story. And it's, it's, a, it's a detail. It's like an extra prominent garnish over the narrative. Really well done. It, like, it's genuinely horrifying imagery when they go to that weird whirlpool where all of the plastic has been like culminated over the seabed. Really, really good imagery. That's not even like sci-fi. That's like reality. I like it quite a bit underrated overhated i agree flippant i like i i like the globe hopping it's one of the few times i think that chibnall's globe hopping approach to storytelling actually benefits it because they also split up the companions and give them quite a bit of agency over the course of the story and also rest in peace to that actor who passed away like um a couple of months or like a couple of years after the story was broadcast Thapillo maro pafella from this story passed away in his sleep after a violent altercation. On the eve of his 25th birthday, he was beaten by a group of, of security guards and then passed away in his sleep. Yeah, that's a bit of a depressing association for the story now. But yeah, so rest in peace to with, um, rest in peace to with Apello Maro Pafella. So yeah, you have to like Praxius now because I've given it that sad backstory. So can you hear me? I'm going to go for another seven. Because uh, I appreciate what it's going for, and I think the dramatic stuff does hit really, really hard, particularly Yaz's stuff. Um, one second. Let me figure this out for a second. Um, Mr. Tardis, Series 12 ranking. Did I rank Praxius, or can you hear me higher? Uh, Praxius. Yeah, I rank Praxius above can you hear me. Yeah. Okay, I, knew, I just wanted that reminder. Uh, I might go for six. Because, yeah, there's a lot of really bullshit stuff here. Like, the sonic screwdriver just going from its, uh, from the 13th Doctor's pocket into her hand when she's tied up. Um, I think that having, like, what, what, it's like one of the old gods, Zelen, is really, really cool. And then it turns out Zelen is just trying to awaken another one who's not remotely as interesting. Um, I think that they could have done way more with Graham and Ryan in the story as well. Yeah, it's got some cool elements to it, though. You can tell that it was, like, really rushed in the edit, though. Haunting of Villa Diodati, I'm going to give a 9. Uh, it's it's definitely the high point of the series, and one of the high points of the Jodie Whittaker era. Um, it's, a, you know, it's a great first chapter. Uh, and, you know, really moody, great gothic horror, a great depiction of Mary Shelley uh, and Byron. Uh, there's just some really, really, f really, really fun b bits in it as well. Like when um, um, uh, Polidori challenges Ryan to a duel <laughs> for his honor. It's really, really funny. And yeah, beat. I've even got the beat mug from Can You Hear Me. Council of Geeks hates haunting. I know that Davis also hates haunting as well, but nobody quite, you know, not everybody has a big brain like me. You need to have a really high IQ to understand the haunting of Villadette. <laughs> that's a, that's a copy pasta. Um, but no, to each their own. For me, it's really, really effective. And then Ascension of the Cybermen's a decent start and the Timeless Children just decides to be three finales at the same time and the center cannot hold. It's, it's not very good. Revolution of the Daleks is a seven. You know, the, it's a decent, fun way to spend an hour on New Year's Day, and I think that Ryan's departure was exceptionally well handled. I thought it would be Graham who would get the really good send-off, but it turns out I really like what they did with Ryan in that story. But yeah, and Flux. Right. Notepad. Right, what do we got? So for Flux, we've got the Halloween Apocalypse. Uh, War of the Sontarans, Once Upon Time, Village of the Angels, um, Survivors of the Flux, and then the Vanquishers. <sighs> I don't, why is this one score? Right, um, Timeless Jordan, yeah, yeah, there's some good stuff in Timeless Jordan, you know, not the best, 
I like Ashad's pretty cool. You know. Sasha Dewan's killing it. We're going to make an, a mean average for Flux. That seems like the best way to go for it, I think. So, hmm. Halloween Apocalypse is I with a cool ending. War of the Sontarans is easily the standout of Flux. It's probably one of the best things that um, Chris Jibnall has written for the show as well. War of the Sontarans is an easy nine. Once Upon Time is when the wheels start coming off. Some good bits in it, but it's it's a little bit haphazard. I do respect the audacity of dedicating one of your six chapters of Flux to resolving an impromptu cliffhanger from the end of War of the Sontarans. That's quite ballsy. Village of the Angels, I want to go for a seven. Great cliffhanger, but it's undercut by the next story. Really nice reinvention of the Angels. Jericho is a fun character, and I'm glad he came back for the rest of the series. Good performances, a terrific direction. Uh, yeah, Village of the Angels is a seven. I think that's some of this stuff not revolving around the Doctor and Jericho, like, the, you know, the village floating in time and, you know, Yaz and Dan doing the rounds and is a little bit meh. Um, okay, hot take, but I think that Survivors of the Flux is the weakest Chris Chibnall script of his entire run. It is, yeah, it's not good. Vanquishers is fun, but that's about it. The entire, yeah, this is weaker than all. I know that Chibnall didn't write off in 55, but out of the entirety of the Jodie Whittaker era, Survivors of the Flux, I think, is the we is the weakest story. Right. I need to figure out the average of this now. So, what is it? You add them all up and then you divide them by, yeah, okay. So, we've got, we're doing big brain maths here, folks, okay? You need, oof. We're doing long division. So, 7 plus 9 plus 5 plus 7. I said, wait, well, no, I, I think I've got it. Yeah, it's, yeah, 7. Sorry, 7 plus 9 plus 5 plus 7 plus 2 plus 6 divided by 6. Takes us to 6. That was big brain maths, but we got there. Flux gets a six, but my god, wh why is that? It will be so interesting now to know how an entire series stacks up to the rest now. That wasn't fun or clever. I don't know why they did that. We need a platform for that. But we are. We absolutely are. <laughs> We're going to one of those ones that flips around. Uh, I don't approve. Too high? Nah, six sounds about right. Because even if the full thing doesn't come together, stories like War of the Sontarans and Village of the Angels and just the sheer enjoyment of the Vanquishers it kind of salvages it. And the Halloween Apocalypse, it's a solid start. Okay, Eve of the Daleks, I'm going to go for a six there. It's fine. It's all right. But here's the thing, though. I think that Flux overall is better than just Eve of the Daleks. This Doctor Who magazine... I, I, I don't approve of this. Legend of the Sea Devils is often 55 level, I think. It's better than Survivors of the Flux, but it's still not very good. Uh, some uh, you know, decent, decent idea and directions, and it's cool to have the Sea Devils in it, I guess, but it's just not particularly well written and put together. It's super duper rushed. It's what, like the second... It's like the second shortest 13th Doctor story, even though it's the penultimate special. Uh... But right, Power of the Doctor, I'm feeling eight, yeah. I, I was and still am really positive on it, but if we are doing, like, mathematical rankings, where I've got to get the calculator out again, uh, then an eight seems about fair. I enjoyed it quite a lot. Really good stuff I, I, to be found in it. I think that a lot of the resolutions are quite rushed. Like, it's disappointing that Ace and Tegan don't actually get a goodbye with the 13th Doctor, which is quite disappointing. But then again, they get their own scenes with 7 and 5. Uh, it's directed spectacularly well. Jamie Magnus Stone does an amazing job. Performances are really strong. I really like the regeneration, particularly the closing line. Um, music's really great. Fun opener. It's got a lot of the weaknesses of the Chibnall era. But, yeah. Okay, cool. So... Right, chat, 
is there any massive discrepancy? And we're not talking, oh, I think Deep Breath should be a seven. We're talking like you gave this a 10 and I think it's a three, for example. Is there any sort of like, <laughs> Legend of Sea Delve is too high at three? <laughs> nah. Um, so yeah, anything else? Into the Daleks should be high. The giggle, yeah. Into, really? Into the, you've, you've seen my review of Into the Dalek, right? You know that I don't have much time for that story. Uh, Kill the Moon should... I, I'm not... The thing is, is that I don't really like Kill the Moon. But very, very smart people who I respect also really like it. Magician and Witch should be a 7. Absolutely not. No negotiation there. Shameless G's no negotiation. It gave Legend of Three. It should be a 1. You gave Orphan 55 three. No, Orphan 55. I would watch Orphan 55 over Hellbent. I would watch Orphan 55 over Twice Upon a Time. I would... It's probably in the same camp as like a right... I think, nah. I think Orphan 55 is exactly where it is. Evil Dalek is biased. Demi got over Hellbent. You should too. No. And I will... Me, me and Demi will have, <laughs> will have a street fight. Anytime, any place. She just needs to say what the weapons that we can bring are. Yeah, Theo. Hmm? Theo. Theo's meowing. Hmm. Okay. Learn to understand how... <laughs> yeah, Jackie Weaver authority. Anyway, let's get this submitted. So let me put my email address in. Okay, submit. Yeah, Theo. Come on, jump up. Oh, you banged your head. Here we go. Doctor Who magazine, sponsored by Theodore the Cat. I love this chat for collectively reviewing 14th Doctor. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what we do in it. Anyway, so, I've submitted. I've just noticed why do you have a picture of Frank in the first one of your war? Um... Okay, Castor, are you in the UK? I'm not sure if you are, but it is like now legal mandate to have a, a Rocky Horror Picture Show photo uh, in your office space. I don't know what the government are thinking, but that's just a legal mandate. So, the Doctor Who magazine 60-year poll. The form has been submitted. My submissions for the 12th and 13th Doctor stories. You can go on DoctorWhoMagazine.com forward slash 60th poll, or just go on DoctorMagazine.com and follow this tab at the top. And the... Um, and the results from this particular form will be available in the, the the next issue after the next issue of Doctor Who magazine. The next issue is going to have the results from the 10th and 11th Doctor, which I did not vote for. 